following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Israel's entrance into Nukva, the promised land. According to Kabbalah, Serampin and Nukva, both Aramaic words, are two of the unfoldment of the nature of God that join in a spiritual marital union called the Sabbath day. The outcome of such a union becomes what Jesus in the gospel called the second birth or the birth of the new body souls engraved with the nature of the Holy Spirit of God, which are the vessels for the outpouring of God's delight. So Nukva is a make for female, and is also known as a Shekinah, also an Aramaic word, which means rest in place, <coughs> the indwelling of divine presence. It is the feminine receptive principle of the Sephira Bina the Holy Spirit. Nukva also corresponds to the Sephira Malkut, the kingdom. Gnostic Kabbalah comprehend that the feminine principle of God is placed within the Nukva, Malkut, the soul of an initiate becomes a Malakim, a king or queen. By absorbing these female principles of his kingdom, their physical body. These female principles are something that can only be given to a king or queen, the Malakim, through the willing reception of the female creative waters from their kingdom, Malkut or physical body. Thus, it is said about Nukva Malkut, there is no king without a kingdom. Nukva is also referred to as Bat, Hebrew word for daughter, the daughter of Hohma. In the physical body, the, uh, uh, Nukva represents the collective souls of the initiate that is bottled up into his ego. Although Nukva is receptive feminine, it is also active in the masculine genre, since although in Kabbalah the term Nukva is used for the feminine force, it is only in the metaphorical sense and does not only necessarily refers to women in the literal sense.
So, as the title of the lecture explains, Israel's entrance into Nukva, and we are associating the Nukva with the Promised Land, which indeed, uh, as uh, you remember in previous lectures, we uh, stated many times that the Promised Land, of course, is the fourth dimension and beyond the Garden of Eden itself that we were talking in different lectures. And uh, <coughs> this word Nukva that we uh, mentioned in the Parasufim and that we associate it with, uh, with women, of course, is the topic of this lecture because it's related with the mystery of Israel, which you know is uh, mentioned in the Bible several times. <coughs> the people of Israel, the chosen ones. And we need to clarify this uh, topic in order for us to understand what indeed is uh, Israel and why are they called the chosen ones. As well as why the Son of God, Christ, personified in Jesus, is called the Son of God. Of course, all of these, as you know, are symbols that we have to understand. As many times we have stated, Gnosis or knowledge is the doctrine and clause within the book of Genesis. Genesis is a book of the Gnostics, meaning the book that encloses the mysteries of that which we explain in different ways. To begin, let us uh, explain the word Israel that uh, we explained in different le lectures before, but we are going to repeat. Israel is written with the words, I mean with the letters, uh, Hebrew letters, Yod, Shin, Resh and Aleph Lamed Israel. Kabbalistically, in relation with that, we see that the first letter Yod of the name Israel corresponds, of course, to the holy name of God Yod He Bab He. As you know, uh, this name, sacred name, is associated in different ways. But uh, we always uh, point that the letter Yod, which is just a dot, is represented in the Sephira Keter, which is the crown in Hebrew, and that represents the father in Christianity. And uh, uh, as you understand and uh, we explain, that letter Yod of Keter uh, is associated with the first triangle of uh, the tree of life, Keter Chochmah Pina, which we always state are the three primary forces which makes one force, the holy three unity or trinity of in Christianity, which is represented in many uh, ways in different religions. So this Yod, of course, <coughs> implies the first triangle, the Logos, in the world of Atsilus, the world of the archetypes. The archetypes, which are precisely the samples or those elements that uh, need to descend into matter in order to, for the universe to appear. Any universe, any cosmos. Of course, the main cosmos that we are talking in all our lectures is the microcosmos, which is the human being. So, 
in the world of Atsilut, this yod, of course, contains or symbolizes the archetypes that are the property of the fire. Remember that the yod is a manifestation of the aims of or, which is a third aspect of the unknowable divine, the limitless light. Ain Sof Or, which is about Keter. And of course, the dissension of those archetypes of the fire or, or the light or is represented in the letter Shin, which in Kabbalah is a symbol of fire. That's why when we take only the letter Yod and the letter Shin together, we form the letter Ish, or I mean the word Ish, and that is fire in Kabbalah and in Hebrew. So Ish, of course, is telling us that the fire that we are talking about is coming from above and manifested in the Trinity of the letter Shin. Because it's always, uh, the letter Shin has the form of a fork, a trident. That's the letter Shin. Plus the Yod, of course, is forming the Tetragrammaton, the fire Ish. So this, of course, letter Shin, which means fire, is always associated with the Sephira Da'at, which is the Sephira of mystery, which means Gnosis, knowledge, which in our lectures we stated is the upper Eden called Da'at. This uh, Da'at, together with the first triangle, form uh, what we call in Aramaic as well, Arik Amping. You remember, which is called the vast continents, the huge face. So indeed, uh, uh, the huge face, of course, corresponds to Keter Bina, and that are the, mani the creative manifestation of that Arik Amping, of that Aram Kadmon, which is the Logos which is God. This in Kabbalah is called the first righteous one, which is God, the righteous one. And of course, from the first righteous one, from that emanates the second righteous one, which we call Ser Ampin. Talked, of course, in the in the lecture of Parsufim. So we have here two righteous ones. The first one is Arikampin from that above, and the second one is Serampin from Hesed below to the world of Yesod. Serampin is formed by six Sephiroth. And the one here in the very bottom is what we call the Nugba, the bride, the female. With the Nuva that encloses the mystery of the light which descends. Because the light from above of the ains of Or, from that element that Moses says you shall not make any image of it because it is abstract, which is above Keter. That light needs a vessel in order to manifest in all the universe, in any dimension. That vessel is called Nugva. The matter, the earth, the female. Of course, in Hinduism, we call it the Divine Mother. It's called uh, uh, Prakriti, 
has different names. But in uh, mysticism in Judaism, in Kabbalah, it's called Nubba. So, Serampin, Arikampin, Nukva are Aramaic words, as well as Shekinah, it's an Aramaic word, which means the glory. When you read in the Bible the glory of God, you are reading the Shekinah of God, or the female aspect of God. It's very hidden. And that's why uh, uh, we explain it, because uh, in both uh, uh, religions, Judaism and Christianity, they don't talk too much uh, about the female aspect of God, because uh, it is uh, believed that God is male. But really, when we read Kabbalistically, God is always showing male, female, the androgenism in different ways. So, of course... <coughs> and that is hidden within Shin, the fire, the letter Shin, and the letter Yod, which symbolizes, of course, the Dat, Keter, Ish. You see, that's why you find uh, the word fire made with the letter Yod, the Dat, and the letter Shin, Ish. Because fire, indeed, is related with the first triangle, Keterho Mavina, and letter Shin. That is the dis dissension of that fire into matter in different levels. Now, the letter Resh of Israel is the letter that represents the head. See, when you said Resh, it represents the head. And the head, as you see always, in the tree of life, when you put the human being behind the tree of life, he's related with the first triangle. The letter Reish. It means that the fire of Ish, that we are talking here, Ish Ra, refers to the first triangle. And beyond, the ins of Or. That rage by itself is what the Egyptians call Ra, the god Ra. Of course, it's a symbol of the light and the fire, which is above, on top of the universe. Because the world of Atziluth, which is represented in the first triangle of the tree of life, relates to the seventh and zero dimension far beyond our understanding or apprehension because we are here below in the third dimension above us is the fourth and above the fourth the fifth and above the fifth the sixth and above the sixth the seventh and zero <coughs> which is the absolute of course zero is the absolute so as you see, Ishra is telling us and pointing us to the fire from above, to the light from above. And of course, the word El in Hebrew means God. So the word Israel means the fire of the God Ra. Or the igneous particles of the god Ra. That is, Kabbalistically speaking, the meaning of the word Israel. Of course, <coughs> this Israel is represented by all the archetypes. Because are you seeing? The word Israel here is re relates to the first triangle. All the archetypes that most manifest in El, which is God. Now, in Kabbalah, the word El by itself, Aleph Lamed, appears for the first time 
in the Sephira Chesed, which is the individual spirit of every single being. This is what we call in Greek the monad. Monad means unity. That L, which is translated as God in Hebrew, is the Ruach Elohim, the Spirit of God that was hovering in the beginning upon the face of the waters. And that, of course, corresponds to that. When you read that in the beginning of time, the Spirit of God was moving upon the face of the waters, microcosmically macrocosm speaking, macro, that refers to that, because in that, we find what is written in Genesis, Shamayim. And as you notice, this word has the letter Shin in the beginning. Shamayim. And Mayim means water in Hebrew. So it says Shamayim. You are talking about the waters related with Shin. And the letter Shin corresponds to that. So it means the waters from above. As you remember, uh, the second day of Genesis is, let us separate the superior waters from the inferior waters in order to make the firmament in the middle. So the superior waters corresponds to Shamajim and the inferior to Majim, Yesod, the lower waters. That could symbolize the oceans, the river, the lakes, or our own sexual waters in our genitalia. So here, of course, that spirit that moved in the beginning upon the face of the waters is Chesed, moving into the sheen, into the fire, fiery or fiery waters of heaven. This is how you see that indeed this Israel corresponds to Chesed, within which the archetypes are placed in the water. Many times we explain that Chesed is related with Abraham, the exalted father. This is the meaning of Abram in Hebrew, exalted father. Of course, that exalted father is related with that because there is where you find father and mother. Ava and Aima. Many times we talk about that. So this Ava is Abraham. Abraham. Abram. Ab. Ab. Aleph and Bet together means father in, in, in Hebrew. So Abram means exalted father. It points above. The great prophet Abraham existed, of course, came to the earth to represent this. As Jesus came to represent the Lord, Christ. And every single prophet represents something within. Because we are talking about the archetypes. Or elements. That we had to develop. That's why it is written. That Abraham. Is the beginning. Of the dissension of Israel. As you know, from Abraham came Isaac, from Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob, the twelve tribes of Israel. That is a dissension, which is precisely the meaning of the Israel's entrance into Nukva. The whole story in the Bible hides all of this because it's the initiatic way in which that is processed. And any initiate. This is explained, of course, in the Hebrew way. Because the Hebrew language hides the mysteries of Kabbalah in the Bible. In the Bible, because it's written in Hebrew. 
but the mysteries of Kabbalah or the numbers of the mysteries of Gnosis are hidden also in other books which are not written in Hebrew they're written in other languages so they had to uh, uh, unveil in different manners but since we are talking here about Israel we have to explain it in the Hebrew way Kabbalistic way it means that the science of Kabbalah belongs to the universe in this planet of course uh, all the mysteries were hidden in the Hebrew language due to the fact that uh, in the Hebrew uh, race many great masters were uh, incarnated in order to deliver this in different times in order for us in the earth to receive it <coughs> and that's why we are receiving it so most of these mysteries uh, that we explain here as written in, as are written in the Sohar the Zohar which is a book uh, a discussion between many masters masters of course of Kabbalah Hebrew masters what you call or you wanted Jewish masters as Moses was a Jew as Jesus was a Jew talking about masters and all the prophets of course these uh, rabbis which is how you call the word master in Hebrew wrote that book and based on that book is written the book of Genesis because Moses also spoke Hebrew an ancient language which hides the wisdom that we are explaining here so that's why it is written in the Bible that Abraham came from the city of Ur better said Or because when you read that in the Bible in Hebrew you find the letter Aleph Vav Resh that makes the word Aur which means light corresponding hmm. of Or so when you read that Abraham came from the city of Ur, it is clearly saying it came from the light. It is, it is true, because Abraham, of that archetype, is the unfoldment of the light through the letter Shin. And this is how here we study it the dissension of that because we have to understand that each one of us has his own individual particular Abraham as each one of us has his own chesed or is his own spirit hmm? or his own Ruach Elohim if you want which is called in Sanskrit Adman which means soul. Mm -hmm. So, of course, uh, uh, that Anman, that Hesed, that Abraham resides in the very depth of our consciousness. Each one of us has his own one. And through him, the archetypes called Israel descend into the matter. But we have to know the mysteries of that in order for that to be accomplished, to be fulfilled in us. In other words, we have to be initiates. Because the initiation is a way in order for us to understand the path. The whole story of Abraham is a story of initiation minor initiations that we talk in different lectures and superior or major initiations because that is the way in which Israel enters into Nukva which in this case the Nukva symbolizes the vessel the female aspect the mother that is called Ima 
Sometimes we call it aima because there is a letter I left there in the word. But really, in Hebrew, is 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 uh, named is is pronounced ima. <coughs> but you want to read all the letters aima. Oima Elohim. So without the Divine Mother, the archetypes cannot descend. Without the Nukva, the archetypes cannot develop. And that's precisely the mystery. Now, as you remember, if you read the book of Genesis, it is stated there that Abraham married his half-sister called Sarai. That's the beginning of his name, Sarai. That means princess. A princess, of course, is the daughter of a king. Because Sarai is the unfoldment of the king. Keter, which is Chochma, Bina, together. Keter means crown. Now, how do you write the name Sarai? You write it with the letter Shin, and the letter Resh, and the letter Yod. Three letters. Sarai. But it's pronounced Sarai. Princess. As you see, the letter Shin there showing again fire. And the letter Resh, which is letter with the head of Varikamping, is also there. And the letter Yod. Which represents the three primary forces. So in the word Sharai, princess, you discover that it is only an unfoldment of the Trinity, of the three primary forces. Sharai. And of course, is placed above. Because the letter Yod corresponds to the first triangle. That is called Sarai. The female aspect of God in the princess. Which is an unfoldment, of course, of Bina. Because Sarai, or the letter Shin, is placed always in that so Sarai. So this Sarai has the archetypes within her womb. It's a female aspect, the Nugva. And that's why it is written there that she was sterile. Sterile, so is that right? Meaning that still those archetypes are not developed. So then Abraham, which is also come from Ur, is represented always in the Sefer Adat as Abba. And the outcome of Abba and Aima, which is Hesed. That's why it's called the Exalted Father. Now, let us examine the word Sara, Sarai, which is, of course, the vehicle of the first initiation. Because in order to enter into the path to initiation, we have to know and we do it through Abraham. Why? Because the spirit, Abraham, Hesed, our own particular individual, El, inside of us, God, is the one that enters into the path. 
Many times we talk in different lectures. That is not the personality here in this physical world that enters into initiation. When you receive knowledge and you start working on the path, it's God, the one that is uh, fecundating the waters in the beginning. As you read in Genesis. And God said that there be light. It doesn't say there and uh, Joseph uh, or John or somebody else said that there be light. No, it's God. Because we had to understand that it's that part of God that does it inside of us. So we need a cooperation, in other words. When we do that work, we have to understand that we are, of course, the lower part, the physical body, or the higher part of that spirit. The physical body, in this case, as we explained in the beginning of the lecture, is also the nukva. And many times in different lectures, we said that the, the physical body is feminine because it's the vessel that receives the archetypes in order for us to perform the work of God, the creation. So here, there is a mantra for pranayama that we teach. You have, you find it in the, uh, the books. In order to transmute the sexual energy, <coughs> we call it the Egyptian pranayama mantras. And the mantra is ton sa ham, ton ra ham. Ton corresponds to the sexual potence. And ham, of course, corresponds to the heart. But between ton sa ham and ton ra ham, you find just the syllables sa and ra, which together form the word sa ra. Sa ra. The name of the spouse of Abraham, which uh, I'm, we're explaining here. So Sarah is written with uh, three letters, Shin, Resh, and Yod. Sarai, princess. But Sa, Sha, is of course related to the lunar forces, creative lunar forces. And Ra symbolizes the solar forces. So in Sarai, we find the duality. Hmm? Or oh, Sarai, we will say the princess Sarai, the feminine aspect of God, is a division of the creative forces. As it is explained in Genesis. Before Adam was androgynous, but in order to make Adam divided in two forces, Eve is taken out from him. So when Eve is taken out from him, this is Sarah. You see, Sarah is emerging from Adam. So the division of sexes, or the division of the two forces, which are one, are of course coming from the emergence of the feminine aspect, which is always related with the sexual force. That's why we always state that from the Holy Spirit, Bina, emerges the Divine Mother in order to make Ava and Aiba. <coughs> That's precisely the meaning of it. So in the Divine Mother, Sara, Sarai, the two polarities, which are also within Abraham, Abraham. But Abraham, which is, of course, the exalted father, in order to bring the archetypes into manifestation from the world of Atiluth, he needs the feminine vessel. And that's why in the life of every prophet always appears the feminine aspect, the Nugva. That's the Nugva. The highest aspect of the Divine Mother. 
But as you know, the story of Abraham goes that he descends from the city of Ur, right? And goes into Egypt. Because Jehovah Elohim, which is the Sephirah Bina, tells him, come from the, your relatives and your parents from above to a land that I promise you to give you, to you and to your seed. I will multiply you. Of course, it's the ascension of that spirit into the matter, which is Malkut. That's the ascension. Going down. Into Malkut. Which in the Bible is called Matzarim. And this Matzarim is translated as Egypt. So in Hebrew, when you said Egypt, you said Mazarim, which is a symbol. It's not what the people think. The country of Egypt there in Africa, or the Middle East, something else. People always read that literally, and they get confused. Because everything that we are talking here goes down into Egypt. In other words, into the symbology of Egypt. Because all these archetypes that we are talking here are represented in Egypt as well. But in the language of the past, which was not Hebrew. All of those gods and goddesses that you find in the walls of the temples of Egypt have the same representation as we explained in the beginning. Israel, although it's related with the god Ra of Egypt. All of that is there. That's why uh, uh, it is written, bless you. Uh, from Egypt I call my son. Oh, I call my son from Egypt. In many parts of the Bible. Jesus came from Egypt. Moses came from Egypt. Because Egypt encloses the mystery that we are talking here. Which is Malkut. In Malkut, as we explained in previous lectures, is placed. All the archetypes. All the archetypes are placed there. That we need to develop. And that we explain that is the Garden of Eden. Symbology. So then, of course, <coughs> in Egypt, you find the people that are slaves from the physical matter, identify with the physical world. It's anybody that identifies with the physicality of this three-dimensional world is a slave of it. And that's why it is written that in Egypt, Sarah, or Sarai, that vessel that Nubva had a servant which was a slave whose name was Agar. So this Agar, of course, the servant of Sarai, is another symbol. Many times we explained in the previous lectures that we had two wombs. We explained that the spiritual womb is related with Sarai, which is the spinal medulla. It's called the tree of life. That spiritual womb related with Sarai that has to begat a son there. But there is another womb, as you know, in Egypt, the physical body. That womb in Egypt, the physical body, is a uterus. Of any woman. And that is a servant. Of the first uterus. Which is the spinal medulla. The uterus of course. Begot children. For the physical world. As you know. But the spinal medulla. Begot children. For God. That's the promise. The covenant with God. Is in the spinal medulla. That's the womb that God 
relates to and concerned with. In the womb, well, everybody is born in the womb, in the uterus, the first womb that we talk, even the animals. So, of course, when the, the spirit descends into the matter, it wants to fulfill the commandments of the Jehovah Elohim, the Holy Spirit, which is, of course, the sexual energy. Always begins begotten, creating in the first womb, which is Agar, which is the other Nugva, which creates for the world, for the three-dimensional world. And of course, relates also to that Nugva or group of people that knows about Kabbalah that knows about the knowledge, about the doctrine. That people is called Ishmael. That's why it is written that Agar begot Israel from Abraham. But Abraham is that sexual force, spiritual force that descends into the sexual organs. So when you find, of course, here the duality, there's a duality here. The first son of Abraham is Ishmael. As you see, that word Ishmael begins with Ish, fire. Yod and Shin, Ish. And Ma, Mem, which is the water, a symbol, symbol of, the, of, of the mother. The letter Ajin which sounds also ah in Hebrew, but it's an ah coming from inside. Shema. For the forces of the mother, but down, in other words. And El is God, as you know. So Ishmael is the first son of Abraham. In other words, those elements, archetypes of the fire of God, are also in each mile, but they are not in activity, only in potentiality. This is Ishmael, uh, uh, many people uh, state, that relates to the Arabs. But indeed, Ishmael represents everybody in this physical world because it comes from Agar, which is the first womb, the uterus of any woman. I am Ishmael, you are Ishmael, and anybody in this physical world, whether masculine or feminine, is Ishmael. The outcome of the fire of God, which is an exile. Because Israel, I mean, Ishmael was in exile. What is the Sefirah that is in exile? Is Malkut, Egypt, Matzarim. We are in exile. We are children, of course, of Abraham as well, physically speaking, because the Spirit of God that hovers in the beginning in the waters <coughs> creates in the physical world or in the internal world. That is just apt to the person. So that's why it is written that the children of the slave, Agar, are many. But the children of Sarai are few. Because in order to create Isaac, which is the second son, you need to enter into initiation. It is written in the Bible that when Abraham begat Isaac, he was hundred years old. In many lectures we explain that the age in esotericism is related with initiations. Hundred years old is related with the first creation in the spinal column. 
when the initial enters physically into the path, then his own inner being, his own Chesed, his own Abraham, begat within his or her womb, which is the spinal medulla, Isaac. And this is how Sa, Ra, the lunar and solar forces in that body create Isaac. So this is how we reach 100 years of age. That's the first age for the first initiation of major mysteries. <coughs> so Isaac, of course, is the development of our consciousness in relation with the Kundalini, which the Bible calls Isaac, which is written with Yod, the letter Zarek, which is the Z, which is make the sound is 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 that sound reminds us isis the fire that rises in the spinal column is sahak of course the end of that name is the letter uh, cup which represents of course that uh, uh, cap that the Jews use on top of their heads means that when you that do that, you are, of course, transmuting, you are in chastity, and you are acquiring the first level, the cap. The cap is the first level. Anybody that reaches the cap or wears the cap means that he is somebody that reaches the first initiation of major mysteries. Well, but there are many people that use the cup, of course, and they don't know anything about this. Even the Pope uses that. And he doesn't know that because he doesn't have a nubva, a wife. Because in order to rise that, you need a wife as a man. And the woman is a, 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 a male. It's not that, that because you believe in that, you are going to receive the first initiation of mere mysteries. As above, so below. If you are a man, you need a nubva, you need a, 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 the female aspect here. Because as you see, in order to, for you to comprehend that you need a woman, that is not just by believing or belonging to any, any group. The Bible says in that first Isaac is born, Ishmael is born. And Ishmael represents, of course, the outcome of Egypt. And how are we going to have children in this physical world if we have not a woman, if we are, if we are men? Or how a woman is going to have children without a man? Ishmael is born because there is a woman and a man there together in the sexual act. So everybody in the beginning is begotten children in that way. And you know that. But Ishmael, of course, represents the people that know the mystery. We will say the first covenant, which are the people that study the knowledge. Whether they are Jews, whether they are Hindus, whether they are Buddhists, Christians, doesn't matter. As long as you are studying the doctrine, you become an Ishmael. It's just you are a child of this physical world, of Mazarin. But if you want to accomplish the promise given unto Abraham, your own spirit, then you have to transmute the sexual energy. And for that, you have to love your inner goddess in the sexual act. And that's precisely Isaac, which is the child that is being born in the spinal medulla. You see, Ishmael is born in the uterus of any woman, but Isaac in the spinal medulla, whether in the spinal medulla of a man or, or, or a woman. And that the cup, Isaac. And that's why, of course, uh, there's name Isaac. It presents the mysteries or the Isiactic mysteries of Egypt. Because Isis is a mystery of the female in Egypt. Isis, Isaac. Fitting with Shin, of course, because it's the mystery of fire. Uh, 
As you see there, of course, that is the first initiation. When somebody reaches the 100 years old, then above in the world of the spirit, Abraham, Chesed, absorbs Isaac, his son, which is Gebura. And that Gebura is uh, the divine soul. Gebura is justice. So Isaac represents Gebura. So Isaac, Gebura, and Hesed, Abraham, are one. In the first initiation of Mayor Mysteries, the son, Isaac, and the father, Abraham, becomes one flame. And that's why in Kabbalah, when you talk about Isaac, you're talking about Abraham. Or oh, Abraham and Isaac is the same. Of course, in order to, to achieve that union, you have to absorb the forces of the four rivers of Eden. Now remember that from that, which is the upper Eden, the four rivers emerge. Well, the river that comes from there which is the river of creation, the array of creation, four branches or rivulets come from. Those four, we always stated, are represented by the four elements. Or the four cherubim of Ezekiel. The first one is a lion, which is Abraham, the fire. He said. The second one is the bull, flying bull with wings that represents Isaac. The third is the eagle that represents Tifereth, which is Jacob. And the fourth, of course, is the water here in Yasod, which is the man into the image of God that emerges from all the initiations that we are explaining now. So you see, all these initiations, all this story of Abraham coming from Ur into Egypt and begotten Isaac with Sarah, is a story of all the minor initiations and first initiation of major mysteries that each one of us has to accomplish. Because within those initiations, this is how little by little, the 12 attributes of Chochmah descend, which are, of course, the attributes of Christ or archetypes that we need in order to develop as a human being. In Atziluth, we have, of course, Chochmah, <coughs> the second Sephira, that is represented by the Zodiac. When you study astrology and Kabbalah, you find that Chokmah is associated with the Zodiac. Well, the 12 constellations. And these 12 constellations are related with the 12 tribes of Israel. But who are there as archetypes, as light, you see? That's why Abraham says, and I will multiply your seed like the stars. In the firmament. This is what Jehovah Elohim said to Abraham. Because those stars of the firmament of the zodiac are the archetypes, the light that descends from above in each one of us. Those are the, that's why Chochmah, uh, the second Sephira of the Holy Trinity, encloses, of course, those archetypes. And that's why it is written that, that from Chochmah enters those archetypes into the Nugva. Because Chochmah has that. You know, how do you call that heaven of Chochmah or the or heavens in, in Greek? Uranus. 
This is how it's called, Uranus. And that's why Jojma is also associated with the planet Uranus. But when you see Uranus there, it doesn't mean the planet itself, but what in Greek means heaven. That forces of the archetypes in heaven, the 12 constellations, the 12 tribes, are in the archetype manner within Chokma, within the zodiac. And that is Uranus. As you remember in Greek, that Uranus is the first that appears as a king of the universe. If you don't know about that, let me refresh your memory and to explain about that. Uranus is precisely coming from the Trinity. Uranus, Gia and Eros, the Holy Trinity in Greek. But Uranus, of course, related to Chochma, which is wisdom, the Son, the Christ. Whether the twelve tribes are as archetypes. And Eros is the Holy Spirit. Easy to understand because the word erotic or herotic is from Eros. It means it's something sexual. Yeah, sexual force. Eros, which in, in Hebrew is called Anael. Now, do you remember that in the lecture, the uh, Parsufim, we stated that the fourth Nugva, or woman, which is holy, is called Urania Venus, right? Coming from Uranus, means related with heaven. Venus, Urania Venus coming from heaven, here, from that, in other words. Any woman in this, uni in this uh, earth that reaches that level of mastery is equal to Urania Venus, the fourth type, superior women. Now, what is called Urania Venus? Do you remember, according to the mythology in Greek, let us put aside a little bit the uh, Hebrew mythology and enter into Greek mythology. Uranus was taken out of his throne by one of his sons, Saturn. And Saturn represents in the tree of life, Bina, the Holy Spirit. Saturn, of course, is the one that is related with time. Kronos is called Saturn. So Cronus, Saturn, comes from his scythe and castrates Uranus. In other words, it's easy to understand that from the sexual power of the sun, Chokhmà, emerges the power of the Holy Spirit. Because then Saturn says, now I am the boss of the universe. But listen to this beautiful myth. From the castration of Uranus, the blood falls in the ocean, in Shamayim, the superior waters. That's the ocean that I'm talking about in Greek mythology. Not the, the water here in the earth. And from that foam comes uh, Aphrodita, Aphrodita. That's precisely the meaning of the word Aphrodita, which in Roman terms is Venus. So the son of Uranus, the son of Chochma, is Venus, Aphrodite, because come from his testicles. You see? By the action of the Holy Spirit, Saturn, which is the sight. That's a, a beautiful symbology there. Right? And of course, that Venus is Urania Venus. That's why Dante Alighieri, Italian master, says very clear when chanting to Urania Venus, to Aphrodite there in heaven, he says, Divine Mother, daughter of thy son. You see? Daughter of Chochma, he calls her. Daughter of Uranus. Divine Mother Urania Venus, daughter of Uranus. 
the Christ, the Son, the second aspect of the Trinity. Because this second aspect descends with all the archetypes in Urania Venus into the earth. This is how Christ descends, sacrifices, enters through Sarai, through Abraham, to Egypt. This is how he is enclosed. The symbol of the story of that. That we find, as you see, not only in the Bible, but also in Greek mythology. So this beautiful Venus, everybody has it inside. That beautiful Venus, daughter of Uranus, because of the castration or the active of the Holy Spirit, castrating the forces, the sexual forces of Chochma, is our Divine Mother. That in Christianity is called Mary. Isis, Rhea, Sibeles, Tonantzin has many names. Because this symbolizes in many religions. From her is how we had to beget Isaac. She's the one that has to descend, you see, and to beget that Isaac inside of us. Because that is the unfoldment of that cosmic force into each one of us. And only to originate, eventually, the man into the image of God. Because that's precisely the mystery of that. The explanation of the creation of the man into the image of God. is the initiation. It is not as many people think. When they read literally the Bible. That God made uh, uh, the man into his own image. Yes, it is written like that. But they think that the man that the Bible refers is Ishmael. All of us. No. It is written that God has nothing to do with Ishmael. He says, no, I don't want to my covenant with Ishmael, but with Isaac. Because to them is how the, how the forces of Israel, Israel, the archetypes, descend and developed in each one of us. So you see, Israel are the people, the archetypes, that have to become one in each one of us. Although all the parts of the being, all the parts of Chochmah, of Juranos. That's why in Kabbalah we said that Israel comes in the beginning from Chochmah. It enters into that and unfolds and descends through Abraham into Egypt. Now the story there. But after you reach the first initiation of major mysteries, which is the union of your the divine cosmic soul with your spirit inside of you, you need to continue the path. Because remember that Malkut is only the physical body, the very bottom of the tree of life. And we need to rise all the sephirah up in order to create the many to the image of God. Because God is here above, but he descends in order to help us. Then, of course, Isaac, which follows the sequence of initiations, is the one related with Yesod, superior part of our physical body. He marries Rebecca. Rebecca is the name. But before entering into Rebecca, let me tell you. That is written in the Bible that Abraham had other two concubines. Sarah was uh, his wife. Agar was the slave servant of, Agar, uh, of uh, Sarah. And the other two mates are written there. It says, and Abraham had other mates, other concubines. When it says concubines, it means two. So there are the four aspects of the four rivers. Of Eden. Because as you know, Eden represents all the forces of the body related with the archetypes in the sexual force. Which is always related with the nubva, the feminine aspect. So it is written in the Bible 
that this uh, Isaac may also those four aspects of the Nukva, or the four rivers. And it's written only in a simple way. It's written like this. And Isaac brought Rebekah into his mother's tent, Sarah's, because well, Sarah was her, his mother. And took Rebekah, that's the first Nukva, the first river, and took Rebekah. And she became his wife, that's the second river. And he loved her, that's the third. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. That's the fourth. You see? Why is it written like that? Which is really well. Why is it not written only well? And Isaac took Rebecca and this is it. That's his wife. This is it. But it's written in this way. Took Rebecca and she became his wife. And he loved her and was comforted after his mother. <coughs> All of that implies four steps. Meaning that these four aspects or concubines of Abraham, Sarah, and Agar were in Rebecca in one when Isaac took him. Why? Why we are talking here when Abraham says Sarah, Agar, and concubines? By why in Isaac says only yeah, with Rebecca, Rebecca in the first, the four in one, because in Yesod. As you remember, which is Eden, the lower Eden, all of those rivers merge together. The sexual force. So when you start working in the second initiation of mirror mysteries, you are working with these four forces, which are represented in, in the four ethers, or four tadwas that we talk in many lectures. That's the nukva. That comes to you through the sexual alchemy, the sexual union. And in there is where Isaac has two children. Jacob and Esau. The duality of the two forces. Because you see that in your thought you find the duality always, the sexual force, the duality. You always find that. Esau is written Eshau with Shin. And Jacob, of course, represents the ascension of that force in the spinal column of the initiate. But it's always a duality, two forces. It is written in the Sohar that Esau brings the forces of the serpent into the body. And it's because in Yesod we have the two forces. And the sexual force, in other words. We feel the animal force of sex and the spiritual force. These two forces, animal and spiritual, are represented in the duality of Jacob and Esau. But Jacob emerges from the animal fire of Esau. We need to transmute the fire of Esau, which is animal, into Jacob. In order to place Jacob in Yesod. Because Jacob is that part of us that fights, you know, against the angel. If you read the Bible, you find that Jacob fights in Yesod against an angel. And the angel says, well, who are you? So strong, you know. He's conquering, of course, eating again. Many Kabbalists say that that angel is Samael, which is the sexual strength in Scorpio. And Jacob defeats that temptation, the force of Esau. And that's why it's written that when Jacob was born, came from his mother womb, holding the heel of his brother. Right? And the heel, of course, represents the sexual force of Malkut. Meaning that this Jacob comes through the animal force of Esau, which is in Yesod. 
But of course, you know, even as Au is the first one that appears there, which is because, because they are twins, the inheritance falls into Jacob because also Jacob is the one that raises here. Jacob is the ascension. You see? Of the sexual force in the spinal column, in the spinal medulla of the vital body. With that development, of course, that Jacob is the outcome of the creation of what you call in Buddhism bodhicitta, the man in Yesod. That's why in symbolism, when you represent the man, represents the face of a man. This is Yesod. Those are, as I said, the four creatures of Ezekiel. The man is Yesod, the eagle is Tifereth, the bull is Gebura, and the lion is Hesed. So are the four creatures of Ezekiel. But the man here emerges because the image of all of those three forces emerges in, are emerging in Yesod. And this is how we start creating the human soul, the terrestrial man called, that human soul that eventually will develop and be the vehicle. That's why this Yesod is associated with Tifereth. Jacob says it's Tifereth, but it says Jacob is in relation with Yesod. Because the human soul has his foundation in sex. When we start developing our own particular Jacob, we do it by extracting the force of receiving the inheritance that is coming from above that belongs to Esau, but that we take with the transmutation thanks to the advice of Rebecca, the Divine Mother. Did you see? <coughs> so all the forces of the four rivers of Eden are originating Jacob. In Esau, the duality again there. But this duality is not in Malkut, because the first duality, Ishmael and Isaac, corresponds to the world of physical world, Malkut. But the second duality corresponds to Yesod, which is Jacob and Esau. And Jacob is the one that conquers the cubic stone of Yesod. Jacob is the one that here rests in the stone of Yesod and see the ladder that goes up to heaven and that the Spirit of God descends through sex, through Yesod and rise again because this is precisely the ladder, the door in order to go up and down Yesod. So you see how the Bible hides all of this? So if you have the time to study it little by little, then you start uh, uh, understanding the meaning of all of those lives. We have to state that Isaac existed also. A great prophet, a great patriarch. Jacob also, which was the Bodhisattva of an angel whose name is Israel. But we're not talking about those individuals or eons. Talking about the symbol of them in us. Because if we want to be children of the promise, we have to enter into initiation. It's not that you, are going, you have to be born in the Jewish race in order to be a chosen one, no. You want to become a chosen one, you have to choose chastity. You have to enter into the path, and little by little, you are choosing yourself in different levels. That's to be a chosen one. It doesn't, doesn't mean to believe in anything or to follow any tradition. It's to follow the path of initiation. Because that, this is how Israel enters into Nukva. 
Now, if you follow the story of Genesis, you know very well that Jacob, which is related with Tifereth and uh, Yesod, is the one that materializes the 12 tribes. Because after he conquers here from Yesod, of course, from that stone where Tiferet is resting, which is Jacob, emerges then the third initiation, Hod, which is written, of course, in all the story of the 12th. Because Jacob had four wives. His first wife was Leah, but he was in love with uh, Rachel, or Raquel, is what you call it, right? So Raquel and Leah, of course, represents, Leah represents the hidden mystery of the Sephiroth above. While Raquel represents, of course, the manifestation of those mysteries in the initiate. Because Raquel only had two children, Joseph and Benjamin. Right? Only two. While Leah had six children, or six tribes, it says, plus one daughter. The daughter of Leah, and Ab uh, I mean, in Jacob, and the other six brothers represents all the Sephiroth from here below. You see? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven, Malkut, is the daughter called Dina. That's Dina, which always relates to Malkut. But Dina is not taken into the 12 tribes. Because Dina, Malkut, is a fallen Sephira. All of us are related with Dina. Which are the story relates in the book of Genesis. Is raped by a prince. And then it's, it's, you can read that story. That. But that Dina represents the physical body, Malkut. Because it's written there that Dina goes outside in the land. And see the daughters of the land. It's what we do. Who are those daughters of the land? The other Malkuts. The other physical bodies of the people there. And they get identified with the, those daughters. The beauty of Nahema, we will say. We are identified always. And because of that, we are raped. Our consciousness, our psyche is raped. So that is Dina. The only daughter of Jacob. Because he's also the physical body. But the six children of Leah, the first sister, represents all the Sephiroth. One, two, three, four, five, six. The only, the only two daughters, or I mean two children, Joseph and Benjamin, are related with uh, uh, Raquel, which was, uh, uh, that Jacob was in love with. We represent, of course, the other Nukva, below. And as you know, the story of the third initiation of major mysteries begin with Joseph. It's written in the seven words, book written by Matthew Samael on the or. He talks about the third initiation of major mysteries, which is the transformation of Joseph, which represents the astral lunar body, Hod, into the superior astral body, which is called Benjamin. Read the seven words in order to understand better. Because we are talking here in synthesis in general. But all of that, of course, <coughs> is how Genesis be, uh, ends with the story of Joseph. Right? And after that begins Exodus. But all of that, of course, relates with the creation. The, the end of that is the creation of the astral solar body, which is Benjamin. Because Benjamin represents the superior forces of Arikampin. While Joseph represents the lower forces that come through evolution into each one of us, which is the Kamarupa, the astral body. 
this lecture, of course, in synthesis, is giving us some principles. In other words, we are placing in your mind the archetypes for you to study all of this return or entrance of Israel into Nukva. Because if you want to enter into the chosen ones, to be a chosen one, you have to know that Israel is within you in different levels. This is the archetypes of God within you, that Israel. The archetypes of God within every single soul. And you need to enter into the initiation. And in order to enter into initiation, you have to know how to handle your nukva. That nukva below is called physical body. And we explain in the other lecture that the nukva is related with three Shabbats. The Shabbat above, the Shabbat that is the creation of the Nukba below. And as you see, for instance, the word Shabbat is written with Shin. Saturday, in other words, in English. And letter Bet and letter Tav, which make, makes the word Bat. Bat in Hebrew means daughter. So when you said Shabbat, you are saying the daughter of the fire, Shin. So in other words, the mysteries of Shabbat are the mysteries of fire within the Nukva. And that's why the third commandment of God says, you shall keep my Shabbat holy. In other words, simple. You have to keep the physical body, which is the Shabbat, the Malkut, holy. Hmm? You have to keep also my other daughter of the fire, which is above the Divine Mother, holy by honoring father and mother. And you have to keep the other Shabbat, which is the sexual act, holy by not fornicating. That's the three Shabbats that we have to keep holy. So to keep the Shabbat, the daughter of God, holy, doesn't mean that you, have to, you, you don't have to work on Saturday. Because all the people there, you know, the Adventists, Pentecostals, they don't work on Saturday. Because they, they think that in that way they are uh, accomplishing the third commandment. You shall, you shall keep my Sabbath holy. But they don't keep it, even if they don't move any finger during that day. Today is Saturday, by the way, which is related with Saturn. But in order to keep the Sabbat, the Shabbat holy, means keep my wife, keep my daughter above and below holy, because she is Shabbat, the daughter of the fire which is above. And the only way to keep that Shabbat holy is by entering into initiation, into chastity. Because if you prostitute your body, <coughs> you are not keeping your own particular Shabbat with your physical, your own nukva here, physical body, holy. If you prostitute, if you injure any woman with your sight, if you look at her in a lustful way, Jesus said, you are committing adultery with her in your heart. You are, of course, injuring the nukva, the bat of the fire, the Shabbat. That's why, you know, the, according to tradition, the authentic, uh, righteous one, the Zadik, is how you call it, the Zadik, coming from Isaac, is the Zadik, the one that is an initiate, shouldn't see women with lust. And they have the custom that when they see other women that is not their wife, they don't look at her, following that tradition. But the truth is, that you have to learn how to see women without lust in order to keep the Shabbat holy. Because every woman 
is a representation of the daughter. Because he's a female. So anybody that prostitutes the woman, he's not keeping the Sabbath holy. It is difficult to learn how to see women without lust. It's very difficult. Matthew Samael on the earth said, you have to learn to see even your wife without lust. If you see your own wife, not other woman, only your wife with lust, you are breaking the daughter of God, injuring the, the mother, the Shabbat, the daughter of the fire. So, of course, this implies that we have to enter into initiation and to follow the path. As you remember, the king or the emperor or the pharaoh of Egypt also commits many mistakes with Sarah, the wife of Abraham. Abimelech also. And God punished them because it is written, you have to keep my Sabbath holy. But they injure, they, they look at Sarah in the wrong way, and that's the problem. So everything that we, you see in the Bible reading that, looking at the wife of Abraham or any other wife of the prophet in the wrong way, that's related with the Shabbat, the daughter of the fire. From that bat daughter comes many names. Bet or Bat Sheva. You see, it's the, the backwards of Shabbat, Bat Sheva. The daughter of the fire. Or the daughter of the seven. So this is how the Bible encloses many mysteries. And I repeat. That's why we insist. In order to return into Eden. Into the promised land. We have to know. How to respect the Nukva. And for the women. We will say. That the Nukva for them. Is the physical body of the man. We have to respect, see with respect, and the first nukva for them is their physical body. So I, that's, this uh, statement falls in both sexes. Because I have my nukva, which is my physical body. As you see, uh, this, is, this is how you understand the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. It's related with to keep the Sabbath holy. And this is a long path. It's, it doesn't mean that you're going to do it in one week or one month. It's a psychological work that you patiently do in big cars. It is written with patience you will possess your souls. And here is another meaning. I told you in the beginning that Nuva also represents all of the parts of your soul which are bottled up into your ego in Egypt. That's Israel in exile. The part of your soul, the consciousness, bottled up into lust, greed, pride, envy, laziness, gluttony, etc., 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 and are of course in Egypt. Do you have questions? The question is from, from where this doctrine of Kabbalah comes, right? From Egypt or from where? Well, like, you said how the, like, the ego and the Egypt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what the, so like, how does that The doctrine of Kabbalah, this doctrine that we are teaching here, of course, belongs to the universe. But what's brought for a great angel into the earth? That angel is called Metraton. Metraton gave the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet to humanity. And of course, from that uh, 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 alphabet, the Hebrew language was originated. In the past, of course, uh, 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 there were many languages related with that alphabet. As you know, according to the Bible, the prophet, physical prophet, in this case, Abraham, came from the city of Ur, which was a Chaldean city there in, in Asia. 
But Ur means light, Aur, or. And of course, it hides a symbol. It means that this knowledge of Kabbalah was among the Chaldeans. Before the Chaldeans, this knowledge was among the Shemites. The Shemites are the origin of this root race which populates the five continents of the world. Of course, there were uh, people that didn't uh, cross sexually themselves with other races in the past, and they kept that uh, Shemite or Semitism in themselves. Because really, uh, the Jews and the Arabs, they say that they are more Shemites than all of us. But really, uh, this Aryan race, called Aryan race, is an Aryan race, has seven branches. And uh, the Jews and Arabs are the third branch that comes from the Shemites. But all of us come from the Shemites. The Shemites were, of course, the fourth uh, sub race of the Atlantean civilization, where this knowledge was originally brought to the earth. But it has other roots in Lemuria. This is doctrine is very old, very ancient. But of course, we're talking about the story of, of this doctrine in the earth, related with this Aryan race in which we are right now. But that comes, of course, and is in all the universe. It exists everywhere. It's not only in this planet. We have a question there. Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, for that, you have to. Oh, the the question is: Is Adam also a prophet and a symbol of uh, this human race? For, for, for mankind. For mankind, yes, that's unquestionable. But Adam itself, the word Adam, implies a lot. We gave many lectures about that. Adam represents above and below. Oof, it's, 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 it's an archetype. Adam and Eve. We gave uh, several lectures related with the Garden of Eden already, three lectures. One is already transcribed there, which is a number three. Well, uh, if you start reading number three, you are going to read it backwards, but uh, you always, because we still we are waiting for the second and the first transcriptions, which always we explain better, because sometimes uh, uh, this uh, cryptic way of teaching is very difficult, and we try to explain more and more. But anyhow, if you uh, re uh, hear these uh, uh, first and second lectures and read the number three of the Garden of Eden, you will understand about this Adam and Eve. In the third lecture, which is already there in the website, is uh, very clear about Adam and Eve. Uh, another question? Well, everybody, uh, it is a, a problem to follow the, the, the laws of the Israelites or the traditions in this physical world of the Jews, is the question. And uh, do we have to follow the dietary, uh, uh, how do you call it, tradition that they have in their, in their religion? Well, if you are a Jew, you have to follow your tradition. But indeed, as Matthew Jesus said, <clears throat> it doesn't harm what you eat, but comes from within you. There are many rules, of course, in the book of Moses, the, the commandments of Moses about how to behave, what to eat. But that is, if you are transmuting the sexual energy, if you are a real Jew, then you understand why is this saying, because what you eat is transform into sexual energy. But if you are not transmuting your sexual energy and you're just following traditions, it doesn't matter what you eat because it doesn't make any change anyhow. But when you enter into the path and you know that the sexual matter is created, but what you think, what you eat, what you feel 
even what the impression that you receive, then you have to select little by little according to your own will. But by following traditions, for instance, pork is an element matter that feeds lust because it's a devolving animal. That if you are transmuting your sexual energy, if you are on the path, if you are not on the path, you can eat any pork as much as you want. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt you because you are not transmuting. But if you transmute, of course, you will see that it really hurts. But there are, of course, many uh, uh, Jews, uh, many uh, Muslims that don't eat pork, but they fornicate, so it really doesn't matter. We have to follow the, the rules inside and to awake in order to know what to do in this physical world. That's, uh, 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 that's another question there. No, this was not a physical man that, well, exists many, many men that his name is Adam, you know. <laughs> I know that, right? But uh, that was a prophet called Adam that represents that? No. Adam represents the Lemurian race and uh, many archetypes. It says that uh, uh, Adam wa received the, the Kabbalah for the first time from a prophet, right? But that represents the root race, the androgynous root race in the beginning that received this doctrine, right? That's the Adam Kadmon, which was androgynous, that was not divided in two, right? That is, that's his representation. But in, in, in a particular someone, that his name was Adam, like Abraham? No. Your question? How can we be sure that the, the symbolism are still intact, are, are still valid in the Bible if we read the Genesis? Well, the question is, how, do we, uh, how can we be sure that the symbolism written in the Bible is not altered, adulterated? Because all the translations in different languages. <coughs> well, let me tell you, uh, just by a uh, Hebrew Bible, I mean written in Hebrew, there are many Bibles that are written in Hebrew and English together, in many other languages. And by learning the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, the meaning of them that is already in the website, you associate that and you understand what is written in Hebrew. Because the Hebrew language hides all this wisdom as you saw. And it is more deeper. Oh, it's deeper, you know, but uh, I, I, I just stop it. And sometimes I want to say more, but when you don't know, when you are not initiated, it's difficult. But humanity needs to receive this because humanity has the Bible translated into many languages and uh, translated, of course, by people that are not initiates. And they just, according to their own tradition or their fanaticism, they translate that and they think that they are doing good. But the only way in order to comprehend this is by knowing, I repeat, the 22 letters, only 22, there's no more. And by having a dictionary, Hebrew-English dictionary, and reading English and Hebrew at the same time in order to understand what you're reading. And study the Sohar, of course, because the Bible is written according to the Sohar. Many other books of the Bible, which means Biblos, many books, are based on Kabbalah but are not in the Bible. It's called the Apocrypha, right? Those are sacred books too. You know, we know still have many books. But, uh, and not only the Bible related with the Hebrews, but the Middle East. We studied the Popol Vuh, the Mayan Bible, the Mahabharata, the great books of India. They are always hidden there and many other sacred scriptures that, of course, are not related with the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. But you can associate that when you study it in order to um, unveil the mysteries. Are the uh, books written in other languages and other, from other cultures, are, do they use 
just as much symbolism as we find in the Bible? Yes, of course. Every book is written in a double sense, cabalistic sense, in other words. The people only read the literal sense of it. But the wisdom hidden within it, only if you have eyes to see. That him that has understanding, understand. Quran is written that way. And many other sacred books. Do you have another question? Yeah, there. Well, I, uh, I never read that, but of course, uh, if you associate the planets to the Sephira, you will understand that Genesis, because any type of Genesis is always archetypical, cryptic, symbolic. Don't take that literally, as uh, this uh, English Darwin took it literally. And because he was not initiate, he, he couldn't understand it. So he created his own Bible. It's called the dogma of evolution. And when he says that his man comes from the ape, well, that's his Bible. And many people believe in that Bible, but that is not Kabbalistic Bible. This is just something very superficial. Thank you very much. And keep the Shabbat holy. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Amen.